All right. Psh, I feel like we should have like fireworks at the end of the countdown. Uh, <laughs> and so we go live on Facebook with Marcelo Jarmendia, who's the founder and director of Brazil and Chicago. Um, I actually wanted to invite you to come on the show because you are one of the most seamlessly global people I've ever met in terms of how you um, go around the globe. And you're also one of the nicest people I've ever oh, met. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the world right now, we just, we need a lot of, we need a lot of nice, Marcelo. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. So, and I know too, so it's four o'clock in Chicago, but it is midnight in, uh, in Estonia. So thank you also for that. Um, so you're in Estonia now, you're at the University of Tartu, which mm -hmm. I found out was the University of Good People. So my sense was it was the universe, you know, kind of finding <laughs> you as a good person, like this is where you belong. But how yeah. did you end up, how did you end up in Estonia? Yeah, that's, I got that question mostly from Estonians, uh, surprisingly enough. They, it's very common that Estonians will ask me like, what brought you here? Why, why are you here? In that sense that we are kind of like so distant uh, in a small country and all that, how did you end up mm -hmm. here? Well, I'm going to show I'm gonna, people where it is real quickly yeah, while you're talking, go. just in case anyone doesn't know. There's Estonia. It's the little <laughs> corner. I used to, I, I tell people, Americans, I tell that I can also see Russia from here, just like Sarah Palin <laughs> <laughs> from Alaska. But uh, yeah, I Estonia, University of Tartu is one of the meccas of semiotics. That's what I study here, semiotics. Mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, applied for the program. So two years ago, I was, I kind of like realized after moving back, I was in Chicago until 2014, moved back to Brazil. But after a couple of years in Brazil, still teaching, but I was kind of like, okay, what well, I want to go back to what I have wanted uh, my entire life is to be in academia. I would say yeah. that Chicago was kind of like a detour. Like my plan originally was to be in Chicago for six months, but ended up. Oh, really? Like, yeah, ended up starting the business, opening the school, and then the six months became 10 years. And I'm going Although you back don't really open a business, especially one that was so successful by, by accident. You know, talking about Brazil and Chicago, you trained, from what I understand, over a thousand people around, and not just in Chicago, but around the globe on how to speak Portuguese, uh, como mm -hmm. falar português, and, uh, <laughs> and um, also just about Brazilian culture, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. That's true. Now we have had, uh, yeah, over people from all of over uh, 80 nationalities. That's the thing. I mean, Chicago wow. is a very international city. So we had many, many people, even though the school, uh, we, uh, we offered classes for English speakers and for Spanish speakers. Half of our students were taking uh, Portuguese for Spanish speakers, even though only one third of our really? students. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Huh. Yeah. Only one third of our students were native speakers. So you have about 20% of our students who were mostly Americans, but uh, also other foreigners who already spoke Spanish as a second language. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's a much easier transition to Portuguese from Spanish. So, uh, so yes. And you, you mentioned about, I think that the, the success of Brazil and Chicago, of course, we had like an amazing team, uh, good methodology. Uh, it, it was a niche, of course, but that was, that was a bet that I made uh, in 2006 when I started that I, I, I could see that there was, a, there was a growing demand. When I moved to Chicago, I first started teaching Spanish because that was my experience back in Brazil, was teaching okay. Spanish in companies. And then more people were asking for Portuguese. I was also offering private classes for Portuguese uh, language. And then when I could sense, okay, this is growing, so let's start a school uh, only for Portuguese. And Brazil and Chicago was actually, there is Brazil and Chicago and there is, uh, oh my God, it's gonna, uh, there's a school in New York. We okay. both opened uh, in October 2016. So Brazil and Chicago in this school, like we're basically the first one in North America of dedicated exclusively to Portuguese. Uh, and so that was that was a bet. Uh, luckily, Brazil, because of the boom in the commodities, Brazilian economy was really picking up. And I don't know, uh, I can send you this later, but we did uh, also a survey with the students in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, sorry, 2008. 
to see the interest. And you could see like when we started, we have the pie charts and age group, interest, uh, nationalities, why Portuguese. In the beginning, most people uh, were taking Portuguese because either they were dating or married to a Brazilian mm -hmm. or they were doing like cultural activity. Right, like people. that's me, raise my hand. <laughs> so uh, people uh, taking samba classes or capoeira or jiu-jitsu, something related to Brazilian culture. Okay. Uh, and after 2000, no, actually it was the survey was a little later because uh, after 2009, you see like a huge shift of people doing Portuguese for business. And these are the people who are being sent. Remind you, if you remember, the American economy was doing pretty bad. Well, in 2008, uh, the economy here crashed horribly and the economy yeah. in Brazil was actually booming. booming and really taking off at that point. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I had many students who, mm -hmm. it was funny because I had students who was like on the basic three level and the company is like, okay, we are uh, expanding to Brazil. Who in our company speaks Portuguese? And there was this guy or this girl like, well, I, I'm taking classes. Okay, the job is yours. Go. Uh, so wow. a lot of these people moved to Brazil, uh, ended up starting families there, starting business there, living there. Uh, so, yes, but then there was this shift that people were actually studying Portuguese for business and not for culture mm -hmm. anymore. Um, so... So yes, I think uh, there was it was this niche. There was like a, this combo of the economy in Brazil p really picking up. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I think it was to, in 2012, at one point we had uh, a team of nine teachers. We we're even offering Portuguese, European Portuguese. We had a, a teacher from Portugal, and wow. we were teaching like 13 groups every week. We we had uh, that uh, mm -hmm. center in uh, Lincoln Square uh with the four classrooms and you've been there like we also had the the cultural activities cooking classes the uh dance did you have a background in business as well i mean is this is this is all of this gr grew because it really looked like you scaled it really well mm -hmm. as you added classes and engaged me and i know you said you were speaking spanish so did you have a background in business or how did that sign mm, no no not really uh yeah. maybe a little bit of entrepreneur i i started working when i was 13 and okay but more of that like always now, like what was your first in, job just out of curiosity my first job actually i would go to uh grocery stores markets in brazil with a catalog of this uh canadian company that was making candy so it was important candy and i was 13 and i would go to these companies with the catalog take the order and of course they would deliver i'll get my commission mm -hmm. but i would just go to these different uh shop stores markets grocery stores to take orders for uh, imported candy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I was just curious. I know, so we originally met, and by the way, for people who are watching, please feel free to say hi so that we know you're here. And if you write any questions in the comments, we'll be able to, to see them and respond, both anyone who's watching live now or anyone who, who tunes in afterwards. We, we welcome those questions. Um, you and I met when I, I we may have met at a, um, Oh gosh, it was the the uh, not the Fourth of July, but the Brazilian Independence. I think we may mm. have met there. But then I was president of the Illinois Sao Paulo Partners when you were Brazil and Chicago. And I don't know if you noticed, but the year that I was president, every single event we did, I'd be like, Marcella, do you want a partner? Because wait, it was because you were so much fun, actually. And what I love about how business grows, when I would come to you and I'd be like, um, Marcelo, here's an idea of something we can do. You would always be like, yes. I would always wait for the reason why you couldn't do something. You'd be like, yep, yep, I'm all in. Let's go. Um, and so that is uh, that I feel like that openness to possibility brings possibility. Absolutely. No, and it was like a two way street because I also felt like very uh, welcomed uh, at Partners of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And yo, oh, look at that. I see. Uh, John wanna, <laughs> he was one of their students. He's still one of his students at Brazil and Chicago. We still have group classes going on. Mark, our instructor, is teaching there. Uh, there was Jack who said hi. Uh, oh, nice. I could oh, tell good. Friend studying here like a classmate. That's nice to see these people watching us. Uh, I hope they also make ask us questions and participate. But uh, I remember with Partners of the Americas, at first, I mean, we were kind of doing the same thing, even though, I mean, for me, it was also a very personal thing because I am from Sao Paulo and I was living mm. in Chicago. So, it only made sense, but I did feel like I remember going to the to the first meetings with you guys, and and I was very lucky because it was like a I think it was uh, Gino was before you, 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Was Gino the new? And then I think was. Uh, and for anyone listening, Gino's my husband, so I don't know if you're allowed to do that. It was, you know, my husband was president first, and then, uh, yeah, and then I came in. And then it was Tom, <laughs> right? After you was Tom. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So I yeah. was. I was very yeah. lucky because it's mm. like three people I get along with, three people mm. who are open to like, let's partner, let's do new things, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, I mean, even uh, after we would do the meetings, I mean, we had amazing barbecues together. I do remember like going with the two flags uh, mm -hmm. event, and mm. and then I mean, many many beautiful things came out of of that out of the partnership. Uh, I can mention two. Like first is the uh, Mostra, the Brazilian film series. Mm -hmm. that yeah, that was something that started with partners. Now they are on the thirteenth edition, or they they have. It could be. It's more than 10. So it's continuing to go. Years. And this year, actually, Molstra is um, it's going to be online, I believe. So it's happening oh. again this year as well. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the beauty uh, for uh, people who are watching us, Mostra, uh, the Brazilian film series. So it's this uh, film uh, uh, festival of Brazilian movies with a social impact or a social, social conscience. Film. That was actually my oh. line. Brazilian films with a social conscience. Yep, yeah, because they yeah. all had some sort of message in them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, Ariane, who also was kind of like the, the person coordinating all this, uh, mm -hmm. she reminded me that Brazilian Chicago was actually the first sponsor, the first check. Like when they were thinking about doing this, and we nice. we we had at the at the school like the the movies that we always thought like how can we incorporate culture. The, the the methodology at Brazil and Chicago has always been like an intercultural, like let's always add teach language through culture. So the, the, yeah. the movie aspect is very important. And also the social, because many of our students became volunteers and they love that participating, meeting with the Brazilian directors and actors uh, coming to Chicago. That was the one of the things that I, I'm very, very proud and very excited to see how it has grown. Mm -hmm. um, becoming like an event of Chicago, a culture event of Chicago. The other one was, that was when Tom, uh, even though it was not directly through uh, partners, if I'm not mistaken, the Englewood. So there was the Montessori. School. So Tom actually, which is amazing, Tom Hale founded the Montessori School of Englewood. And it was when he saw the advantages that his high school daughter had and the disparity between different neighborhoods within Chicago. And a lot of people will post on Facebook and say, this is wrong. And no, Tom actually went and founded a Montessori school in Englewood that is, that is still a very strong school today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Englewood, it is like a, it, it is a, a community. Uh, it's a neighborhood in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. uh, has like high crime rates and uh, racial tensions and like the the food desert. All these different things that people think. Okay, this is uh, so many obstacles there. Mm -hmm. But Tom had this thing like, what is the point of teaching these kids about I don't know Chinese language or Mandarin? And it, I think the Brazilian culture is much closer to them. So we're gonna bring. They had there's the second language, Portuguese. So we sent a teacher. Oh, you guys brought Portuguese to the school. That's right. Yeah. I forgot about that. So, so you we were teaching Portuguese. like the kids, and that's a it's a great school, right? Through it's yeah. through sixth grade. Yeah. yeah. We sent uh Yasha that's who was so cool. them samba. So these kids like, had like dance ah. classes. Portuguese oh, they must have loved that. And Beto, that's not a big part of that. We had uh, Capoeira, Fica Capoeira. So these kids uh were thriving, like you know. Martial arts, what kind of martial arts? Capoeira. Wow. Let's so the Brazilian culture is much closer uh, for them to, to, to feel like, you know, inspired by. Uh, so it was, was fascinating to, to, to have like a, a Montessori school teaching Portuguese as a second language, having the Brazilian dance classes mm -hmm. and also Capoeira classes. So these are two beautiful things that came out of this partnership with. Oh, that's partners. fantastic. And that are lasting. That's what's really yeah. exciting is that it's yeah. things that you created that are lasting. So mm -hmm. well, I have a question for you because um, because all that you do has such a global perspective to it. So it's all about culture and, you know, everything you did at Brazil and Chicago, there was always, like you said, there's the dance, there's the caipuera, there's the food, there's, you taught mm -hmm. me how to, the correct way to cut limes for caipirinhas oh, one time. I didn't know there was a correct way. <laughs> You're yeah. like, you know what you're doing, right? And I was like, yeah, I'm just cutting them. So, but thank you for that. I make a really good caipirinha now. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I'm just wondering now that you're in Estonia, so you speak Portuguese, but obviously fluent in English, and then Estonian, which is what they speak there, but also I guess is closer to Finnish. And yeah. apparently there's a dialect specific to Tartu where you are, but what language are you doing everything in, in Estonia? I do everything in English. Uh, okay. It's funny you ask, but Tartu you can easily get by in, in English. Estonia, here's the thing. If you're over 40, you're going to mm -hmm. speak Russian. You know that people over 40, you can talk Russian to them. Most of them will speak Russian because- I mean, Okay, but now do you speak any Russian? <laughs> 10 words. Okay. Uh, now I live in a Russian <laughs> neighborhood. I actually live, my, my building is from the Soviet times. So I live in a Soviet apartment. Uh, oh, interesting. In the Russian neighborhood. Uh, but no, very, very, uh, almost none uh, of Russian. But- uh, I'm going to remind people where Estonia is. Yeah, Estonia. <laughs> uh, and, but you can, because it's, if you uh, and if you're under 30, especially if you're under 25, you're going to speak English here. So this mm -hmm. generation, I'm always like so amazed, like talking to, to Estonians, young Estonians, how like their, their English is completely like spotless. It's fluent, perfect. And he, they, uh, so yeah, so especially in Tartu, because it's a college town, you mm -hmm. can basically do everything in English. It's funny you ask because I, I'm finally enrolled for this semester that starts in two week, two weeks to start taking Estonian classes because so far oh. I, have, I haven't needed it. Okay. Of course, I do want to learn it because I, I think it's always good to learn to speak the language of the people who mm -hmm. are in you or you're in their, their country. The thing is two things. Well, one, okay. Estonian is one of the most difficult languages to learn in the world. Like if you yeah. think it has like 14 cases, it's, it's so difficult to learn. Uh, the vocabulary, I do have a lot of vocabulary in Estonia from grocery shopping. So I, I know okay, sure. I'm not hard here if I had to speak uh, Estonian. Actually, I love going to grocery stores in other countries just to actually get a sense of the, the culture as well. That's a fun place to hang out. Yeah, well, for sure. In the first months here, I would, uh, because I can read Cyrillic, I can read the alphabet. And the Estonian words are so different that for me it was easier to read the ingredients in Russian because some of these words come from Greek or you know it has the same. Oh, interesting. Root of, like, I can understand part of these ingredients. Estonian back then was almost zero. Huh. But the the problem here is that uh, it's a language. The moment they hear an accent, Estonians will switch to English, and they do this mm. out of intentions, like they don't want you to feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. unless. And you ask them, like, no, please speak Estonian to me. I need to practice. Okay. So that's another kind of like obstacle. It's a difficult language to learn, but I mean, you are, I'm here. I, I would have the immersion. So that's that's what I hope for uh, next semester. Like, taking, I'll be taking six hours a week, it's three classes of two hours. Okay. Every week. So, but, but yeah, as you mentioned, like, for, for, uh, it's closer to, to, uh, finish, but that's, mm -hmm it's like isolated like the other countries around here like it's mostly slavic languages and i mean there are scandinavian languages sweden norway and all that but mm -hmm. russian latvian belarusian it's all uh, uh slavic languages mm -hmm. so speaking of being in estonia i do want to talk about what you're studying because you'll notice in the initial announcement for this talk i said you know it's marcelo he's the founder of brazil and chicago and he's studying uh was it social media algorithms and political polarization and then when i posted again yesterday i said and marcelo is going to teach us all how to be nicer using social media um, because i realized someone who's so kind he's at the university for good people and we have this real problem with social media and political polarization. So I thought though, you know what, can you though just for, I'm sure everyone knows, but just in the simplest terms, when you say social media algorithms, tell us that and then I wanna understand better what you're doing and, mm -hmm. and what we will learn from that. All right. Uh, so the algorithms, uh, if you think about uh, the big data companies, oh, also especially the, the social media, they, they they are marketing companies even mm -hmm. though they connect people they like to advertise that we connect people no they sell ads right and sure. by us connecting and chatting and liking and commenting we are telling them or the algorithms what we like mm -hmm. uh, okay 
this economy, this marketing economy, they if they want to sell ads, they need you to be online. They need you to be seeing those ads. Mm -hmm. So it's what they call the attention economy. Uh, the problem that it does is that people usually, they spend more time reading or watching what they like, not what they don't like. So these algorithms will keep feeding you mostly what you want to hear. Uh, so you watch this, I don't know, this, this video mm -hmm. of this commentator and the but this is showing you stuff you want to see based on on advertisements that are coming in or based on what your friends are posting both uh okay. because there is there is that like the friends that you that you uh see, follow the most uh mm -hmm. they know like okay you you have been clicking on these person's stories mm -hmm. you have been liking uh their posts so you'll see that person's stuff more like the more yeah. you like someone's things the more you'll see their things and my understanding when you look at then just I, I i i'm saying it back like to make sure i've gotten it so the idea with social media algorithms is the more you click on things you like whether it's a sponsored post or your friends post the more that those things will come into your feed and so the mm -hmm. idea with political polarization is that you end up it's it's well it's when they talk about the echo chamber that the you're seeing over, all, okay the, i mean the, the the big thing is this confirmation uh bias like mm -hmm. uh, you are okay. going to get fed what you want to eat basically mm -hmm. uh so tell me so then tell me what you're what you so you what's the research that you're doing and then what's the the end goal like how because it's a problem people are dropping off social media they can't stand all the vitriol that's on there um mm -hmm. you know it really is dividing people more than i think it ever has in the past because that's another thing that's another thing in terms of psychology uh, psychology it's uh the the feelings that get you more engaged are not the mm -hmm. best ones it's anger. Uh, so that's why when you see people like going back and forth in, in bickering or sometimes mm -hmm. attacking the other one, the post, what you're you're doing, you're, you're, you're participating in that attention economy. You're giving the attention to that. So that is what is going to give more uh, likes and clicks and comments. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand, like in the American elections in 2016, there were cases of like kids in Macedonia creating these pages of basically clickbait mm -hmm. uh but the idea and they were making money because they would get those ads paid uh but it was just this like and something usually absurd that you're like no I, I have to check if this is true you click it when you click it you're telling the algorithm oh okay you are you may be interested in a flat earth so mm -hmm. the algorithm would put together things related to that uh and what happens why it is dangerous because first you you are uh, the problem is not only what you can uh, cannot say because there's there are policies for all these social medias mm. like you cannot say this we're gonna ban you or, or we're gonna uh, delete your post. That's that's a it's it's a problem, but it's also something that we need to uh, debate and have a conversation. How do we tackle this? Because yeah, you cannot say everything. I mean, if it's your freedom uh, expression ends when you know you're hurting someone. Uh, or, uh, but there is also, it's limiting what you can read, what you're exposed to, because once you get exposed to this, uh, you are in that bubble. Uh, mm -hmm. My supervisors don't like that word. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of research that's saying like, avoid the word bubble in this case, but it's still- it's oh, a, it's I gotta very... ask though, why avoid the word uh, bubble? Why don't, why oh, don't they like that word they, in this they, context? They like the echo chamber, the confirmation bias. What they say about bubble is that mm -hmm. nobody is, can be completely in a bubble because the idea of a bubble that you're, you're enclosed. Mm -hmm. And there are ways of, of course, I, I, if I say, for example, I am on a bubble for uh, this political, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know, but I still like when I go to the bar, I'll meet somebody who is not uh, and who exposed me to a different idea. So it's not that you can be in a bubble. We can talk about if you want to be very specific, like a social media bubble. Uh, and oh, that's nice. Daniel was also a, a, one of our students. Yes. Yeah, so he's a friend for both. I have a question from Jack, which is about food, though. So, Jack, I promise I'll come back to your question. Oh, so. awesome. you, you have that. <laughs> Right, you have the oh, 
where do I see here the comments? Let me click. Oh, now I see them all. Yeah, I'll, I can do that. And this was a Jack asked this question while we were still talking about the grocery store. Um, oh, nice. Actually, maybe this is a good tactic for people. Like if you're on your social media and it gets you need comic relief sometimes because you yeah. get so angry. So now for our comic relief, ¿cuál es su comida estonia, estoniana favorita? So that's, I love it. This is what I love about being multicultural. So this is a question from Jack in Portuguese about what your favorite um, Estonian food is. And Jack is Italian. <laughs> Jack is Italian. He's asking a question in Portuguese. That's, that's I love it about Estonia. <laughs> Jack, yeah, Jack is a good friend here in Estonia. He's probably asking that because when you go grocery shopping together, I always grab a kohuke. There is this sweet called kohuke. It's basically sweet curd. Uh, cheese and it's covered in chocolate and it's a it's a simple dessert here but it comes like in little bars oh my uh, god wait it's cheese covered in chocolate yeah it's a cheese i don't know curd it's the i'm gonna part. have to i have a uh someone who's who lived with us who's actually russian born lives in germany who lived with us when our son was little and her favorite two foods were cheese and chocolate so i'm gonna <laughs> tag her in this and let her Come know on. about this food what's it called again kohoke kohoke Kohoke, and they have like different feelings inside <laughs> too, so like jam or so. Uh, but yeah, and <laughs> obrigado, de <nada. laughs> and... All right, so sorry, so so we're done with our commercial for the kohokado, and um, oh, now kohoke, we are yeah. back to we are back, back to, the... to understanding political vitriol and and yeah. kind of what you're saying. So you're studying the instance of it or how it happens or what's so, what's like your thesis my about research it? is on yeah your research how, uh bolsonaro's camp so i'm doing my uh i'm, I'm actually creating a model that okay. could be applied to other countries but my example that i'm using is brazil okay uh, as you know it's not it's very very similar to what's happening in the united states mm -hmm. uh we got to a point where trump supporters or bolsonaro supporters they to the point that they say like i think there was a, a recent survey in america that said like 20 uh, between 25 and 30 percent of uh trump voters will believe whatever he says and will vote for him regardless bolsonaro also has about 25 30 percent of people who no matter right. what happens uh and and this is related to this like you know you, you they have created before uh more like the the right the far right they 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 would have to struggle to get media attention they would not get media attention uh they were like fringe candidates now with in the past media, right the you're past. talking about in the past in okay the past, yeah, sure, social sure. Media. with social media now they don't need the press anymore to the point that they have created their own channel so and then these people like in their uh i don't like to call it like a parallel universe but they do they do see, let's put it this way, they see reality or the facts. That because you know, that would imply that they're crazy. And I know I said that, no, no, I, I it's just that, a right? theoretical I, implication. I they see <laughs> the world through different lenses. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and, and they can do that now because of with social media, uh, mm -hmm. they have their own like blogs, channels, YouTube channels, where this is like reproduced. So to the point that they have disconnected, like, uh, whatever the new york times wants to publish they're not going to read uh mm -hmm. i don't know and then we'll say something and to the point that these leaders also uh attack all oh, their fake news don't read them right read this. so mm -hmm. they have created a different like uh more than channel of communication they have created a parallel world where mm -hmm. uh where covid is actually created uh by china to dominate and implement mm -hmm cultural Marxism throughout the world. I mean, uh, so this is this is what I, uh, I, I'm i talking about. But a lot of this is done through uh, social media, like the, uh, the Brazilian elections where uh, Bolsonaro won mostly through how he skillful got uh, to use WhatsApp. We see all we see a lot of like how Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, how that influenced the the American elections. Be, so it's it's about that it's like it, it, we can be discussing uh, whatever we talk here like i don't know if people are not exposed to this and there's somebody else telling alternative uh, i mean mm -hmm. wasn't there like a, a trump speaker of the uh, not speaker of the house the spokesperson who said al alternative facts that's that's an interesting <laughs> uh, concept alternative facts. yeah yes yeah 
someone asked a question that something completely wrong. She goes, well, those are alternative facts. I think it was about the number of people that were at the inauguration. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's very dangerous. Okay. That's very dangerous because, uh, we like I'll, I'll give a little example in brazil with uh, whatsapp we have uh there are more phones than people in brazil now more cell smartphones cell, cell phones than right. people and most of a lot of these people they have like a kind of like a prepaid plan or a plan where they get free whatsapp and free facebook so for that they can access they don't need data for that i mean they don't need to pay for it oh, interesting so they will get a message they will get a whatsapp uh Fake news. Oh my gosh! So that was a way that the government could actually communicate directly to with people through WhatsApp. That's the idea. The idea okay. is that we don't need the media anymore. We can talk wow. directly to the to the people. Mm -hmm. And media has been the fourth power. It's that's the. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not what the media does a hundred percent. What mm -hmm. they should be doing is making sure that the other three powers cannot go too mm -hmm. far. They mm -hmm. should. I thought with WhatsApp though that you had to connect with people's cell phone phone numbers. Like WhatsApp, I know we use to communicate with family in Brazil, so it's an instant messaging platform. Yeah. But usually, you had to connect with someone's cell phone number. So how could the government use that to send messages? Well, before even the government, or during the election, mm -hmm. they, you, WhatsApp has groups too, has public groups. Oh, okay, so I didn't realize people, that. Yeah, they have public groups. So if you type, even giving people now a chance of joining the ranks uh but if you type <laughs> also not a political whatsapp group you're gonna see a list of hundreds of uh, okay so they join the group and so mm -hmm. they, they start getting uh these these messages these memes uh these mm -hmm. videos, links talking about uh some during the elections were completely lies mm -hmm. like uh manipulated images the problem is because i told mm -hmm. you these people have their data package that gives them facebook and whatsapp okay. But they don't have, they didn't uh, pay for a bigger plan. I mean, they have limited data, so they cannot, mm -hmm. so they get information, but they cannot access or cannot check it. And that's very problematic because for them, and we have to understand the numbers in Brazil, it's growing so much of people who get their information, political news or news in general from social media and specifically from WhatsApp. You add mm -hmm. one other layer, WhatsApp usually it's very much used. You mentioned the group of, partners or uh that you guys use or you said which group that you use whatsapp whatsapp with oh just in communicating anytime i've done a i've planned a conference or even just for family whenever there's people from different countries we always use whatsapp it's the best app that we found for that international you know multi-country yeah, yeah. communication uh, so what happens is that many people like have their church group their family in brazil is very every, mm. every family mm -hmm. they have their whatsapp group Okay. You get a message. You can be something fake, can be something manipulated, but you're getting that from mm. your family. So you're gonna add a layer of trust to that. So sure. So when you in this is this is what's happening now that we are getting mm -hmm. to uh, to this being easily manipulated. So mm -hmm. the threat that you're gonna we're, we're having more and more is that uh, people can be manipulated through these messages. Many cannot check uh and that is reflected in when mm -hmm. you have a one person one vote system and you can easily manipulate at least one third of these people mm -hmm. uh we have we have mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. so um, is your research and i'm sorry if i'm i'm uh dense in terms of the research is to understand the phenomenon and how it's happening and then is there, you know what it is, Marcella, I'm so sorry. Again, going back to when I opened our conversation and said, you're so nice, you're gonna fix it, right? I keep waiting for you to go, and here's how I'm gonna stop it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, that's why I keep going, wait, I, do, I didn't get it yet. <laughs> no. That's the that's the issue, like I tell people, <laughs> because my entire life, I'm an educator, so my entire life I've been teaching. Mm -hmm. And the solution is education. The problem is that education takes one generation to for you to see the results. Like in mm -hmm. Finland, I mean, if you see every time you see something posting, Finland is the top country in education. They got it right. They mm -hmm. are the best ranking in all these different math competition, whatever. Mm -hmm. They have like uh, uh, media, what is it? media lit literacy courses for these kids uh, at a very, very early age. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the solution is there. The problem is that our politicians, they don't think in terms of 
-hmm. generationally. Think in terms of terms, mm -hmm. four years, maybe eight years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not something that we can see being solved in such a short you know, time. No, what you're talking about is so important, though, because I totally believe that the education system needs to change. Because here, you know, at least in Illinois, everything is about the test and people are studying to the test. It's still about memorization. I feel mm -hmm. like memorization is it it doesn't make sense anymore what you it's need to know now. yeah exactly and it's what you're talking about you need an education system where you know how to gather information you know how to find information what you said media literacy how do you find information and then how do you compare sources or understand where a source is from so that you can evaluate its uh its legitimacy yeah yeah and yeah, there's not a lot of uh, interest. Like in Brazil, for example, I was reading today, uh, you know, the America started, uh, they started the Sleeping Giants. Uh, have you heard of the Sleeping Giants? No, no, tell me. Sleeping Giants is this uh, non-profit. It's like people gathered yeah. and they go uh, <clears throat> a, a website or a, a blog or that, that spreads fake news or are doing like trying to destroy the reputation of someone who are doing like using media as a weapon negatively. Uh, they go because of Google ads or AdSense, mm -hmm. some companies, they pay Google to uh, advertise and Google will place them in like, I don't know, I don't know an anti-vaxxer page. Mm -hmm. There is like a pop-up of, I don't know, Best Buy. So the sleeping giants would go on Twitter and show that ad, that page, and uh, tag Best Buy. Best, Best Buy, is so Best Buy supports anti vaxxers Yeah, like, see, guys, your brand is being associated with this, and okay. then uh, they they cut. So Brazil, they 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 started this uh, sleeping giants Brazil doing the same okay. thing, and they have affected a lot of uh, these uh, websites that are that were making money spreading these. So that's been really people. good. It's someone who's making sure that there's accountability where people yeah. are, are advertising. But for example, there was the federal police. There was a, a, a sheriff in, in in Brazil yesterday who actually tried to make it a crime, like to say, like oh, we need to investigate who are these sleeping giant Brazil, yeah. but he could not convince that that was a crime. Like what they're doing is not a crime. So you see, there is also like a a, a, a backlash, like, you know, no, don't mm -hmm. touch this. Because at the end of the day, these people need the money. Uh, and like Bolsonaro's government today, the biggest chunk that the government has to advertise what they're doing, right? For a long time, it was like magazines, newspapers, uh, TV. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the money goes to Google AdSense. And there are a oh, lot of these bloggers that support. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is this is where like the battle now is going. Like, well, what can we do? Well, we can make sure these people don't get sourcing mm -hmm. uh, or don't get money to operate. But it's still, uh, it's. I read when you mentioned that Marcelo is going to make uh, help us <laughs> understand. Did you like that? You're like, what is that a better thing? <laughs> but what was you said that there might be a model that you're you're using Bolsonaro in Brazil for your research, but there might be what what's the takeaway that someone could use, let's say, in another country? Well, my model I, I, I do through the discourse. So basically, how you can tell uh, through their discourse how they build, because basically language creates communities. Like you, mm -hmm. uh, by having this different language or the different. Uh, uh, worldview uh, that is expressed through language, you create a community. So what I'm doing, my research is that like how how this uh, we call it like the Bolsonarist or the Trumpist, uh, mm -hmm. and, and here we are associating with these politicians, which is also wrong because uh, Bolsonaro one day will leave, Trump will leave one day, but these people, uh, those values will remain, and there will be another one who. We'll take the the the, the stage. Mm -hmm. but, well, all the people who are all riled up will actually go and look for that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and and yes, um, I think the the solution. I mean, I, I don't want to talk That's about. That's interesting. So it sounds like what you're saying is, and this makes so much sense as an educator, that the solution is to actually not attack what's happening there but to help people to come up with a framework like we we're saying about education about how people can see what's online and determine what's truth what's not 
uh, yeah. and make better, like to read the media better is what you're saying. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, the polarization uh, serves their purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hate because my, my research, there is this identity construction and it's it's completely based on the we versus them. So I, I, I made a mistake by repeating that uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember I interviewed here in Estonia, uh, the leader, the founder of the youth organization of the far right party here in Estonia. Oh, the wow. far right is in the coalition. So it's three parties okay. in the coalition. Was this for one of your projects that you were doing? This was for a paper or a study? Yeah, for a paper. Cool. And, hmm. and he said, uh, this guy said like, when it comes to uh, freedom of speech, we'll always have the upper hand because we are willing to say stuff that the left will not dare to say. So in terms of uh, how far can you go with your freedom of speech, the far oh my right. God, if you're willing to be completely heinous and hateful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, remember, I mentioned these are the feelings that will get you involved riled up and it gets to a point I don't look at that did you see I was like come on yeah <laughs> and it gets to a point I mean we have mm -hmm. I mean, the American economy shifted they had the depression mm -hmm. 2008 people lost jobs and the people from the rust belt mm -hmm. it's much easier to tell them like it's the chi it's China that it's a very simplistic way of like we have a common mm -hmm. enemy it's sometimes also an internal enemy uh and and then get people right up like, okay, we, yeah. we, have, we have identified it. And that's another thing because historically we had adversaries in, in politics. Like, you know, we think differently, but it's legitimate that you think differently. And we debate and mm -hmm. whoever is the most voters gets to, you know, run the show for four years. Now with this uh, discourse is more like we identify the enemy and then we eliminate the enemy. So it's very dangerous because it's also this language of, uh, it's a very bellicose uh, language. Uh, but so well, it just seems like no one's willing to actually come to any sort of compromise about what makes common sense good. That people are so tied to their party that they'd rather go toward the party rather than, rather than actually looking at what's good for the majority of people. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. So we have a question from Dan. Now that we've taken on, um, a, we're going to give you another hard subject. Um, so the topic is, if you don't mind, do, is there anything? Absolutely. No, no. Please. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, Dan wanted to know, I love it, if you could just talk about the difference in racism between the U.S. and Brazil. Uh, you know, the two places are a little bit different, don't you think? And one thing actually just in leading into you answering this question, I still always remember, which was so funny that you were joking one time about as a Brazilian coming to the US that you had gotten demoted because in Brazil you were white and in the <laughs> US you were Latino. Yeah. And so I just find that to be interesting. We look at race as a social construct to begin yeah. with, uh, but, but here you go. So there's Daniel's that's question. Definitely, that's definitely an evidence that it is socially construct. Mm -hmm. If you get my birth certificate, my birth certificate in Brazil, in Portuguese says, because it's like, uh, I don't know, uh, hair color, eye color, ethnicity, or, and it says mm -hmm. branco, white. But then I joke because I am, uh, you know, half Portuguese, half Spanish, and I, I had a friend who was also half Portuguese, he was 100% Portuguese, but he was born in the United States, but he's white. I was like, by DNA, we are You're like, it's not fair. <laughs> I, I don't mind that. I mean, it's like I have been more exposed to the sun, true, because I mean, <laughs> topics, but but at the end of the day, uh, those things like then I became and I remember many now it's changing because I love that every decade the the census in all forms in America, mm -hmm. you're gonna apply for I don't know a grocery store uh fidelity mm -hmm. card or something they ask about your ethnicity like mm -hmm. there is it's there every time mm -hmm. so america is always mm -hmm. and the, the the identities the uh ethnicities get hyphenated then you are like yes. South Asian. well and you know there's so many different things and i just realized which since i'm all about like um unconscious bias i clearly just did my bias <laughs> When I said I'm blushing as I say this, when I said it's not fair, that was an underlying assumption. And I do intercultural work, I swear, I don't necessarily think this. But I was like, it's not fair. Like, clearly, you'd rather be white than Latino. And that's clearly not I the mean, case. The point it, was, the, or I guess that's it, your decision to, to make, that, but the point was it's defined differently and you have the same the DNA. You, we have to agree uh, that life is easier in both Brazil and the United States. If you're white, life mm -hmm. is a little easier. 
And then you have the different uh, ethnicities that it, it goes gets more difficult and more difficult. And unfortunately, the truth is, the reality is, the darker your skin goes, the more the harder your life gets mm -hmm. uh, in both countries, at least. Mm -hmm. in the United States. And I think Dan was Daniel was asking also about Europe because that is very true. It's interesting with the U.S. and Brazil. Brazil, they're also it. My understanding is it also tends to be classist, but then when you look yeah. at classism, that there tends to be skin color associated with different classes as well. Absolutely. So ultimately, there still seems to be that racial uh, discrimination or difference. Absolutely. I also, uh, but, but yeah, what I was saying that with the forms, for a long time there was only Hispanic. Uh, mm -hmm. Some forms didn't have Latino, mm -hmm. and I am not Hispanic. Uh, even though right. I have Spanish, but Brazilians are not Hispanics. And that was another debate. So there are some forms that I would tackle, like uh, uh, th three boxes, like Pacific Islander, Hispanic, Native American, because there was no like Latino. And it gets mm -hmm. like, imagine a Haitian, like somebody's Haitian, like, well, I am not Latino. I am not uh, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. I am black, but I am also Caribbean. So, you know, it's, it's I, I love because in America, those that starts getting like, oh, we need to incorporate now this new, uh, we ne have to add another box, another category, another ethnicity. But speaking of uh, the idea of racism, you we can talk together because if you remember, we did something uh, that you started. Uh, there was the communication about racism. Or I think we did uh, when you were Spearhead mm -hmm. uh, Partners of Americas, right? We did like a conference we yeah. did. We did a big conference about changing the racial paradigm. Yes. And okay, so which was really cool. We had a filmmaker from which I thought this was really interesting. And the filmmaker was was from Brazil, and he had done a movie about the um, indigenous peoples of Brazil. And he mm -hmm. did it. It was a historical movie. But what was interesting is all of the people in the movie who were dressed as the native Brazilians were actually from the same tribe, but so they themselves, who were now modern Brazilians, were dressing in a way to present to represent what they supposedly were in the past, which mm -hmm. I found that fascinating when you look at self-representation or culture and what that means and cultural identity. Because yeah, even yeah. they had to use a different language and dress differently to represent their own culture, but from a different time. Yeah. So yeah. No, but we did that and we oh sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. No, I was just gonna say, so the panel was, the panel also was the movie about, um, it was also the movie about the dancers and the dance uh, school in Sao Paulo and the idea of if discrimination made a difference in terms of people mm -hmm. making their way. And what was interesting is there was assumption that the prejudice was based on, that there might be racial prejudice, but some of the people in Brazil were also multiracial. Yeah. And so funny, I think it was Luca, my son, who was maybe eight at the time, who actually said out loud, well, is he is he black or is he not? Yeah. You know, because yeah. we were having this conversation and it wasn't even sure how he self-identified or what his his. Uh, oh, to answer was. to uh, Daniel's uh, question, I think mm -hmm. the biggest difference, uh, I mean, to start with, there are many, to start with is the concept who is black in Brazil and who is black in America. Mm -hmm. uh, so in America, I mean, there's I've heard so many things. Like if you have one percent of uh, African blood, or if one of your uh, ancestors uh, was black, in Brazil it's way, way, way more difficult to get to that definition. To the point we had, I think, it was 2000, was it 2010? The census, one of the latest census, we uh, for the first time they allowed people to self-describe instead of like these are the races, pick one. For the first time, they would just ask an open question. What is your race? The result was over 140 races. So you had people describing oh. themselves as cinnamon brown, milky white, uh, hmm. and so on. So that's that's one thing, that it's uh, the definition. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, as you mentioned, like the, um, America went through like a black power movement. So there is, there were, I mean, the civil rights. In Brazil, because Brazil refuses to uh, officially to accept that. I mean, we we have sold the idea or of the racial democracy mm -hmm. for decades. Oh no, Brazil! It's all in harmony, doing carnival, everybody happy. Uh, 
uh, and we see that no, like in terms of the jails, uh, the people who get uh, gets killed, violence, it's by far, I mean, the numbers. Well, and didn't Brazil off. have demonstrations just now when we have all of the demonstrations and, and the push for equity, particularly in, uh, uh, in the face of police and law enforcement, but equity in society, mm -hmm. there have been uh, sympathy or demonstrations around the globe in support of that, and I thought in Brazil as well. Yeah, yeah, there there were some, uh, but it's far from being as organized as mm -hmm. it is uh, in America, and which is also interesting because historically, uh, uh, blacks had uh, could vote way before Americans. Uh, another thing, like the Brazil was one of the count, le uh, less countries to abolish slavery, so we had slavery for a longer time, way longer mm. than, than the US. Segregation was never, uh, it's funny, it was a, official in America, in the South, uh, places where blacks could not access. In Brazil, uh, it was never official, uh, but you knew, for example, the, uh, the buildings, you had two elevators, the social and the service elevator, and the maids, that's another thing that changed, uh, ended, Recently, before it was common that people had maids. If you go in Sao Paulo and you look for a, a, a condo, you want to buy an apartment or rent a condo or rent an mm -hmm. apartment built in the 60s or the 70s, you're going to have this little tiny room uh, by the utility room. Mm -hmm. Very, very tiny. Just fits basically one uh, twin bed. And that's the quarto da empregada. That's the maid's room. Because before, mm -hmm. they, they were living there. So these people, I mean, they got a very minimal salary. But these people are expected, you know, if you, let's say you're the boss, but I don't know, you wake up at 3 a.m. and you want a sandwich that you had your maid there. Uh, mm. which is, so that, uh, and it's in my research, also there are many, many authors in Brazil that said that that was actually a backlash. Bolsonaro now is a result because uh, things that uh, enraged uh, part of the middle class that now they, they see like, you have to understand that 40 million people uh, uh, left extreme poverty in Brazil uh, recently, and then they got too close to the middle class who was accustomed to some privileges. Now they were sharing mm -hmm. the airport and uh, with people like basically for them, it's like, how come? Like my maid is now taking flights and going to Disneyland. Even the Minister of Economy is saying like before, it was like it was like a, a too much of a, a fuss because the maids when were going to Disney. That's over. That time is over, he said. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was like the quota system, the and there was a new law passed that uh, gave the maids basically now you are official, like it's a job. So you get your salary, you get your mm -hmm. uh, pension, you get a paid yeah. vacation. And for many people, like, oh, I, now I cannot aff afford a maid anymore. So mm -hmm. uh, I think... But ultimately, in terms of societal equity, it sounds like those are all moves in the right direction. It, it was. It was. Mm -hmm. Now we have like, kind of like a backlash that, no, mm -hmm. the way things were going before, uh, we can do it. Like, we still need... Uh, there was this author, this uh, Brazilian... Uh, geographer very uh, famous in the, the 50s and he said that like the brazilian middle class or the Bra brazilian elites some people interpret it as but the brazilian he was saying they are interested in privileges if that costs somebody's rights so be it but as long as they keep their privileges uh so i i would say that uh the differences in racism Oh, another big difference is <laughs> in America, it's you have the freedom of speech. In Brazil, racism is a crime. So you can go to uh, jail technically for racism. Mm. There has never been a case. There was one case almost mm. that happened. There was a match, uh, Brazil and Argentina. And I think it was in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. And the Argentinian player was calling the Brazilian player monkey, macaco, mm. a player. And when the match ended, the police was waiting for the guy in the arrest. Um, actually, oh. I remember that. I do yeah. remember that. It was mm -hmm. maybe there was like, okay, if we have a chance of showing that this law is serious, of course we're gonna It'll be visible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and hopefully I mean, we have hate crimes and discrimination and stuff, but I know sometimes the burden of proof can be, can yeah. be hard, which is why there's still there's still need yeah. for change. It definitely doesn't have anything close yeah. to the KKK. Uh, yeah. but uh but it's still in terms of the numbers or or mm -hmm. 
jobs. Another things that I, that I find very interesting is that they say that in America, by the last name or by the especially the first name, they can tell. So they could refuse somebody's resume based on the name, and that could be racism. We don't have that, like in Brazil. And, and even this, like uh, you, you think about like an, uh, uh, another culture uh, that is very thriving. Like in Brazil, it's not that. So you, we didn't have a Black Power movement. So we don't uh, have so much of it's pretty much blended in. But at mm -hmm. the same time, the, the ratio is, is definitely structural in Brazil. It's not on your face because it's a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there. Well, it sounds like that could actually be we that one would thank you, Daniel, for that question. That could be like a subject for an entire probably like yeah. five hour conversation for <laughs> sure. Um, Marcelo, so I always like to uh, leave people. Let me put this up. So it's intercultural tools. So things that people can do. You're very global. You go everywhere. So it's intercultural tools that people can be more effective interculturally. So I always look at listen for content versus delivery, meaning listen to what someone says, because sometimes people have harsher tones or, or slower, or this or that. So listen for content, state your intent. You may value something differently than someone else. So you may have good intentions. It comes back uh, poorly. Separate the person from the idea, which actually will help with what you're doing, because it's it, a person may have an idea you don't agree with it doesn't necessarily mean that that person's uh that person's a bad person and then this one i had answered i had added the what scares you dares you the idea of mm -hmm. of being comfortable being in in discomfort and getting into new experiences so if you could add something to the intercultural toolkit here what would you add uh for people to be more global and intercultural I think the idea that I think the different ads, because the different uh, shows, I mean, the idea is that identity is built on difference. Uh, you don't know who you are until you're presented to the other. The other mm -hmm. tells you who you are. Like you, you can tell people it's much easier to say like, well, I'm not this, uh, then I am this. Mm -hmm. And so to embrace that, that, that exposure to the difference, uh, who let you at the least uh, at least uh, lets you know yourself better. So that's the least you get from being exposed to to the other. So that's I fantastic. Think. You learn about yourself by by how you're reflected back and how others see you. So to make opportunities for that. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Marcelo. This was this boy. We covered a lot of ground and really fun yeah. conversation. Um, and people in comments uh, afterwards too, this will be available uh, both on Facebook and on YouTube for viewing afterwards. So people fe can feel free to leave uh, questions or comments there. And then next week we are welcoming Shelby Hofling. Shelby is a young woman who has a podcast where she interviews people who are like over 80 and she calls it, she likes to nerd out on her, on her <laughs> gerontology stuff. She learned so much. And so we're going to talk to her about how she got started and just that whole benefit of intergenerational communications. Mm -hmm. So, um, cool. you're the best. I miss you. I miss you. Yeah. Meetings, uh, the board meetings at partners of America, always some good food. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Ooh. <laughs> Georgina, Senia. <Yeah. laughs> All right. I'm going to uh, stay here for a second. I'm going to end our broadcast.